Well, hello, this is Ellen Broderick from Inspired Living, and this is our number two podcast. Um, last week's was with Jules White from Australia, and this week we have Michelle Gross, who is uh, living, who lives in Florida, in Orlando, Florida, and works there, uh, but also does some traveling to South America, and we're going to get into some of that. I wanted to say this week that... Um, what my focus is for this podcast is really people who inspire me um, because I think hearing their stories is, um, is particularly important. Um, we hear a lot on the news about things that are you know, pretty difficult to take in and, and sometimes quite horrific. And, uh, and this will hopefully um, you know, not uh, negate any of that, but also balance it with the, the wonderful things people are doing in the world today. So welcome, Michelle, and really nice to have you here with us today. Oh, thank you. So great to be here. So I thought we could start today. Um, I have known uh, a, a few various parts of your life through conversations that we have had. Uh, and, and one is that you work at a hospital in Orlando. And I wondered if you can tell me a little bit about that work and, um, and what you do and, and why you do it. Oh, sure. Um, I work at Sharing Smiles, which is part of the Advent Health Foundation here in Orlando. So it's a one of the beneficiaries of the foundation. Um, you know, they have the Cancer Institute, Cardiovascular Institute, many beneficiaries, I think 15 of them. And then Sharing Smiles is the international arm that does international medical missions in Latin America. And so I've worked there for almost eight years. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, it's truly a labor of love. Um, I can't, I just kind of happened upon the opportunity based on, you know, I know I was led into it based on my past experiences. Um, but the reason that I continue to stay there is because um, I think we're really approaching global health in a in a social justice way mm -hmm. where we are making sure that every individual has access to healthcare in the three programs that we offer um, in each of the countries where we work. So um, we work, as I mentioned in Latin America, but we have cleft lip and palate, pediatric dentistry and pediatric rehab, which is physical therapy, occupational therapy and speech therapy. And what countries do you um, bring these services to? We work in Mexico. We have several sites in Mexico, the Dominican Republic, Honduras, Bolivia, and Peru. Wow. And and you take a, a, a group of people. I just want to get a little bit of a context. Are there a group of, of surgeons or uh, people from various um, departments that go with you? And, and how does it work uh, in terms of, you said, social justice, that it, it comes from a place of making these services available uh, to people who might not otherwise have them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so... I would say that partnerships are the bedrock foundation of our organization. So yes, it's our, our volunteers from here in the States. Um, we don't take anyone who's not qualified to do the work here in the States abroad with us. So everyone is a professional um, in what they do. And we, so that's one of our partners. And then uh, and any of our donors here in the States um, who, who fund our work. Um, and then abroad, you know, the local medical on-site professionals, the hospitals, the ministries of health, and then even customs who helps us bring all of our supplies into the country mm -hmm. where we're working. So um, without one of the pieces, we would not be able to have the great impact that we do to really like give babies smiles, you know, mm -hmm. fix children's faces and um, have the impact that we do in the lives of so many people. So um, yeah, and then the social justice part of it is just, you know, a lot of groups still today are doing really short international missions and then leaving and not really 
not really taking into account any follow-up care that's necessary. And um, for example, a cleft lip and palate is not just a before and after of a, of a fixed lip, but it can be up to 18 years worth of additional surgeries, um, orthodontia, speech therapy. And so the, the true, even psychology, like how, you know, if the child was bullied as a, as a baby and making them feel whole. So, mm -hmm. um, so we're really invested in making sure that this multidisciplinary approach is available on site for free for everyone who deserves access to that, which is mm -hmm. every single person who's um, affected by um, those three program areas. And then how do people follow up in terms of, you said there can be a need for multiple um, uh, surgeries over, over coming years after someone has an initial surgery. So how does that work? Yeah, so for example, um, if a baby is born with a cleft lip and a cleft palate, they'll need the first, they'll do the cleft lip at about three months old, and then they'll do the palate at about nine months old. Mm -hmm. And then when they're eight, they might need a bone graft. Um, they might need, you know, a rhinoplasty, a nose surgery if their nose is off. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, I'm not a doctor, so, you know, I can't, I just know from working in this field, but... Um, uh, but yeah, sometimes there are multiple surgeries and even revisions that need to be done with uh, individuals. So, yeah. and what is your role uh, in in this uh, really important work that's getting done? Yeah, so I'm the program director. So it's coordinating here in in the states, helping to raise money, and then also coordinating with our international partners, and and really kind of it's so beautiful because I really am just a liaison with everyone who's involved and everyone who's involved in this type of work has such a behemoth heart. So it's so fulfilling. It's mm -hmm. yeah, it's really great. Yeah. Well, it seems like you would be a perfect person to be pulling people together and to be coordinating that sort of thing. I've always felt as though you're, you're, you light up when you speak about the work that you do. And I think that's uh, something that is, is worthy of being shared. So um, can you tell me a little bit then about the work that you do with people who are recovering from breast cancer? And I know that it's been a, a consultation uh, at this point, um, but uh, what got you involved in, in that aspect? Because it's a little bit different from this. It's, it, that's actually in Orlando, isn't it? Yeah, it's here in Orlando through the hospital where I work as well. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I came across two oncologists who are working with breast oncology and gynecologic oncology, and they have a program called HEAL, which is an eight-week program for um, women with breast cancer and gynecologic cancer, and it's basically like improving their habits, improving their diet and their exercise and making sure they get reduce their stress and get enough sleep. And these are the exact anti-inflammatory habits, which, you know, have kept me healthy and able to maintain calm in the midst of stress in my life. Mm -hmm. And I just think they're so important. So I have a group where we're doing, you know, a year long look at these habits and not only a look, but also implementing them and practicing them. And so I thought, oh, what a better way instead of an eight week mm -hmm. approach, which is enough to learn them, but not really enough to implement and stick to something that you're not used to or no one else around you is doing. Yeah. Um, and so I thought, why don't I bring that year long approach to these women and, um, and see if I can support the oncologists with supporting their, mm -hmm. their patients mm -hmm. with these anti inflammatory habits. And, and what was what has the response from the patients been? Is this is this sort of completely new idea to them? Or are people um, familiar with some of the, the ways that um, habits can impact uh, inflammation and health? Honestly, Ellen, I, it doesn't seem like this has been something that they're aware of. I think they know that they should eat better maybe, um, and, you know, get enough sleep, but actually doing it is, um, 
is the hard part. And I think understanding the why. So what's really cool about partnering with the oncologists is that they can also bring the science to the why of these habits. And so it's a really complementary approach to not only informing the women more, but, um, but then helping them implement and understand truly what the benefits can be. Mm. And can you tell me just a little bit about how you implement a year long um, uh, dive into these habits? Like, is it, um, is it a weekly meeting that you have? Do you meet in person? Are you on Zoom? What, what, what is the, the, way, uh, the mode of communication and, and give, uh, give a little sense of what that looks like? Because there may be people listening you know, who would like to uh, reach out to you and share uh, either uh, some of the things that they are hoping for, maybe connect with you around that, but also maybe uh, would like to... Um, uh, network with you around the things that you're doing? Yeah, so I had done my, I did a, my first full year and I'm in between currently year long programs, but mm -hmm. the first full year I did on Zoom because we had people from different places. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I, I kind of have hermit tendencies. So I was thrilled to, to do everything online. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but now that I am starting to travel again for work and I am being around people again, and you can just feel this energy. And I'm, and I'm noticing that even though I do love to be alone, I thrive when I'm with others. And so it's kind of like, you know, how there are like monks who go live in caves in the mountains and that's their way of bringing peace to the world by meditating peace mm -hmm. and for me working hard and being with others I think is the way that I bring peace so I'm ready to start getting back in, per in person with people mm -hmm. but I'm not I'm not opposed to you know if the habits if the only way I can share the habits is online of course I I think it's worthy to share them however I can yeah and of course, we both have, you know, this, uh, this focus of sharing this with, uh, with others and, and, uh, and we do it in, I'm sure, uh, some similar and some different uh, uh, ways, but um, there is uh, something to be said for uh, the access that we have to like people, no matter where they live, to join a program like this to benefit um, I wonder, can you tell me just a little bit, because I think of the, uh, um, the group itself as being a resource to the members. Um, and uh, I wonder what your experience was with that uh, in your uh, first year program. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, with my work is international. So my group also had an international community. Yeah. And I think that's so important because we're learning about each other's different cultures, how the habits can be implemented and kind of what habits people are already coming with. Mm -hmm. And for me, just the international collaboration is, is so important to just making sure that there's more peace in the world. So um, yeah, so I think that was the really cool part of my group was that we had an international, we had a woman from Mexico, a woman from Bolivia, and then four of us here in the States. And so that was really cool. It sounds very rich. It, it sounds like there are things that uh, people could share on all kinds of levels that, that, would, uh, that would bring a richness to you know, each of the participants. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, everyone spoke English in this group, of course, because it, the four of us here in the States were English speakers, but I am interested in doing also a Spanish group at some point, whether it's with the breast cancer survivors or, mm -hmm. or not. Yeah, I was, I was actually going to, uh, thinking about just asking you to speak a little bit because you're fluent in Spanish and, um, and so you, you have that, um, to offer people as well that it, it could be uh, you know something that you um, you could bring to uh, a whole uh, community of people who uh, would like it and might not have access to it in English. Yeah, actually, my 
my husband's from Bolivia and his sister is an oncologist in Bolivia. Mm -hmm. And so I proposed this idea, you know, of teaching the habits to her cancer survivors or even patients mm -hmm. um, recently diagnosed. And she said, you know, their hospital doesn't even have any anything for them right now, any resources about any way that they should be living their life. And so, um, yeah, so there's so much potential for just even getting the basic information about, you know, how these habits can truly improve the quality of life for mm -hmm. people. Can you tell me a little bit, Michelle, about your journey into utilizing these habits and what it you know, what your path has looked like? Oh, I'm sure. I, yeah, I guess I always have been kind of healthy, like tried to be vegetarian and, you know, not, not, not that that's necessarily healthy if you're not doing it with whole foods, but, um, I, I practiced yoga and studied yoga starting about 10 years ago. And so that kind of opened up doors to different teachers and different parts of the yoga practice and philosophy like meditation and Ayurveda. Um, and then, yeah, I joined yoga health coaching and, um, while I was teaching yoga, I felt the need, you know, I just felt the need for something deeper. I, in my work, I'm, not about the band-aid approach I'm about sustainable approaches and so it it also filtered into this yoga teaching so you know people race to class after work like in their tight yoga pants and like fight for a parking spot run into the studio get their like work out some of them a workout some of them like a feel good thing and then leave and probably here in Florida we have I-4 which is our interstate that everyone takes and it's it's like trauma inducing, you know, it's, I'm scarred for life from it. So, um, undoing all the benefits of the uh, practice. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> After one hour only. So, um, I'm like, okay, how can I give some more tools to people mm -hmm. to, to really carry this through their lives and have this sense of calmness mm -hmm. in the midst of chaos. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you mentioned their uh, yoga health coach uh, training, and I just want to uh, describe what that is. It's a program that you and I both uh, have been through, and um, uh, and it's a program run by Kate Stillman. I mentioned Kate, or or, or perhaps Jules did in our last as our last meeting as well. But this is a program where her vision is to um, really bring the the benefits to people all over the world, and and so she trains people in all aspects of the business of. Um, bringing the wisdom of Ayurveda and of uh, deepening your connection to nature and to uh, the circadian rhythms uh, to, to people who are interested in, in then carrying that forward into, into uh, areas all over the globe. So um, I'm hoping that at some point I can get Kate onto this uh, podcast as well and, uh, and hear a bit about her vision because she's another person that I find inspiring. Mm. So, yeah. yeah, definitely. That'll be great. Um, where did you get started with uh, an ability or an interest in partnerships and in social justice? And they may be different places. Mm. Um. When I graduated from college, I joined the Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. And so I was, you know, 21 and I went to the Dominican Republic as a Peace Corps volunteer. Mm -hmm. And that was like my first, uh, I guess, eye opening experience of not being com in my comfort zone mm -hmm. and really needing to be of service because I also needed others to be of service to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it, I think that that's where this idea was born. And, um, and I think if you can just kind of zoom out of 
of the ego for a minute and realize how interconnected we really are and how alike we are, Mm -hmm. um, which traveling definitely helps that. And having people not help you when you don't know a soul or, you know, don't know a language Mm -hmm. um, can be really eye-opening to, wow, this doesn't feel good to be treated this way. And so I will never treat another person this way. Um, And so I think that that's where the foundation started. Mm -hmm. 20 plus years ago. I love your phrase, um, zoom out from the ego. And uh, it, it sort of gives me the, um, the image of um, hopping up to the moon and looking mm-hmm. down and what's important and, uh, and, and where do we fall into that as human beings? I mean, we obviously are a, a drop in the ocean Mm -hmm. Um, but getting perspective on the whole is also really important and often in this, uh, in this day and age is missed. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think this idea that an experience of needing others and having a variety of, um, um, responses from others, some of which it seems like did Uh, reach out, met you, helped you through whatever you were trying to navigate and others, other times in which that didn't happen. And that that has, um, has really um, perhaps even painted the, 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 the form or the colors or something of, uh, of what you decided is important for you to do in this lifetime with others. Mm. Yeah, I like how you rephrased that. Yeah, I think so. Can you tell me a little bit about um, like the, the the actual trip down to one of these uh, 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 countries in um, uh, in South America or in Central America? Um, how long you're there? How many people go? Perhaps how many how many operations take place? What's the response of the people on the ground there um, in terms of your uh, your work with them? Um, yes, I am just about two weeks out from a trip to Peru, and it brings tears to my eyes just thinking about the trip because I'm so excited. We have a team from from Orlando. Uh, I think there are eight of us total. Mm -hmm. That includes the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, the nurse anesthetist, circulating nurse, scrub tech, a medical interpreter, myself. um, Mm -hmm. And then we have a couple of volunteers with the anesthesiologist taking his son for the first time. So Mm -hmm. he's 16. So that'll be a cool experience. Mm -hmm. And then um, we all, and then our Um, We will just have one operating room right now because in Peru, they're still a little bit inundated with COVID. So they've limited our access to the hospital, but we will have one operating room. And we expect to do usually five or six surgeries per day per operating room. So we're hoping that in this week we'll do uh, 35 surgeries maximum. Mm -hmm. Um, We fly typically there on a Saturday. And on Sunday, we evaluate all the patients. So we'll have, you know, our partners do a really good job of pre-screening the patients. So we'll, we'll typically just have patients who are good candidates for surgery and are healthy. Um, but we'll maybe see 50 to 75 patients on Sunday. And then from that group, we'll choose the 35 who will receive their surgeries that week and schedule them based on how far away they live and how little they are and, you know, all the priorities. Mm -hmm. And um, the local community there helps them with transportation, with food for the families, with lodging if they've come from far away. And so it's a really beautiful community event. Mm -hmm. Um, And we were just there in November, actually. And uh, the, the Minister of Health came to our site to just to kind of evaluate us because not a lot of groups were in country, so they didn't have much to do. So it could be a good thing, but it was also like, you know, we're being watched very carefully. Um, and in the end, they said, wow, you know, after such a period of hopelessness with mm-hmm. and fear of COVID, mm-hmm. it's so beautiful to see you bringing hope back to the lives of these families. And then they'll take that hope back to their communities and continue to spread that. Yeah. And it was just a beautiful reminder of why we do what we do. So 
we'll operate through Friday and then Saturday we fly back home mm -hmm. and our partners on the ground there will follow up with the patients in a week and then a month and then um, throughout the year until we can get back next year. It sounds like just amazing work and so uh, both worthwhile and, and I, I love to see you light up as you talk about mm -hmm. it because it obviously really, um, you know, uh, fires you up and is the work that uh, that you're here to do. You know, mm -hmm. it's really a beautiful thing to see people who have found that uh, that work and um, embrace it and, and get enthusiastic about it as well. If, if somebody wanted to contact you to either learn more, maybe, um, maybe contribute or um, be a sponsor, I don't know what the, um, what the terminology would be, but how would they do that? Uh, people can personally contact me at my personal email, um, which is mgross318 at gmail.com. Okay. Um, my organization is AH Sharing Smiles. So you can find us on social media there, AH Sharing Smiles. And the AH is Advent Health Sharing Smiles. Mm -hmm. um, so. And so your personal um, email would also be a place if people wanted to know when your next course is, uh, is going to be launched. Um, yeah, de any of it. There as well. Yeah, so, definitely. Great. Well, this has been an amazing conversation, and I am so grateful that you uh, have taken the time to come and share, you know, just your passion for what you do, Michelle. And it's, you know, it's both so important, but it also comes from, it's, it feels to me like it comes from such a, a true heart. Um, and, um, and it's a gift to uh, be able to share that with others. So I, I hope people enjoy this as much as I have enjoyed talking to you. Uh, ditto. And yeah, when you mentioned at the start that you're, you know, the inspired living, it's so you and it makes me think of that Joseph Campbell quote, like, um, participate with joy in the sorrows of the world and just continue to live inspired and and shine your light where you can because you yeah. never know who it will touch and you're doing that so thank you so much oh you're welcome that that also reminds me of the book of joy which is a conversation interview with the dalai lama and uh the reverend desmond tutu uh, of how mm -hmm. to live in your joy at the same time that there is a great deal of difficulty in the world. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a, it's so lovely to talk to you and thank you so much for coming on and hopefully down the road, I'll get you back on again. Thank you so much. I'm going to go get that book right now. Okay. <laughs> Take care now. You too. Thanks. Now,